Section seven of Beacon Lights of History, Volume Eight Great Rulers by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Gustavus Adolphus, Part One. Fifteen ninety four to sixteen thirty two. The Thirty Years' War, sixteen eighteen to sixteen forty eight. The Thirty Years' War, of which Gustavus Adolphus was the greatest hero was the result of those religious agitations which the ideas of luther produced it was the struggle to secure religious liberty a warfare between catholic and protestant germany it differed from the huguenot contest in this that the protestants of france took up arms against their king to exhort religious privileges whereas the protestants of germany were marshalled by independent princes against other independent princes of a different religion who sought to suppress protestantism in this warfare between catholic and protestant states there were great political entanglements and issues that affected the balance of power in europe hence the thirty years war was political as well as religious it was not purely a religious war like the crusades although religious ideas gave rise to it nor was it an insurrection of the people against the rulers to secure religious rights so much as a contest between catholic and protestant princes to secure the recognition of their religious opinions in their respective states the emperor of germany in the time of luther was charles v the most powerful potentate of europe and moreover a bigoted catholic on his abdication one of the most extraordinary events in history the german dominions were given to his brother ferdinand spain and the low countries were bestowed on his son philip ferdinand had already been elected king of the romans there was a close alliance between these princes of the house of austria to suppress protestantism in europe the new austrian emperor was not indeed so formidable as his father had been but was still one of the greatest monarchs of europe and so powerful was the house of austria that it excited the jealousy of other european powers it was to prevent the dangerous ascendancy of austria that henry the fourth of france raised a great army with a view of invading germany but was assassinated before he could carry his scheme into execution he had armed france to secure what is called the balance of power and it was with the view of securing this balance of power that cardinal richelieu though a prince of the church took the side of the protestants in the thirty years war this famous contest may therefore be regarded as a civil war dividing the german nations as a religious war to establish freedom of belief and as a war to prevent the ascendancy of austria in which a great part of europe was involved the beginning of the contest however was the result of religious agitation the ideas of luther created universal discussion discussion led to animosities all germany was in a ferment and the agitation was not confined to those states which accepted the reformation but to the catholic states also the catholic princes resolved to crush the reformation first in their own dominions and afterwards in the other states of germany hence a bloody persecution of the protestants took place in all the catholic states their sufferings were unendurable for a while they submitted to the cruel lash but at last they resolved to defend the right of worshipping god according to their consciences they armed themselves for death seemed preferable to religious despotism for more than fifty years after the death of luther germany was the scene of commotions ending in a fiery persecution at that time germany was in advance of the rest of europe in wealth and intelligence the protestants especially were kindled to an enthusiasm pertaining to theological questions which we in these times can but feebly realize and the germans were doubtless the most earnest and religious people in europe in those days there was neither religious indifference nor skepticism nor rationalism the faith of the people was simple and they were resolved to maintain it at any cost but there were religious parties and asperities even among the protestants the lutherans would not unite with the calvinists and the calvinists would not accede to the demands of the lutherans after a series of struggles with the catholics the lutherans succeeded by the treaty of augsburg fifteen fifty five in securing toleration and this toleration lasted during the reigns of ferdinand i and maximilian the second indeed germany enjoyed tranquillity until the reign of matthias in sixteen twelve this usurping emperor who had delivered germany from the turks abolished in his dominions the protestant religion so far as edicts and persecution could deprive the protestants of their religious liberties Matthias died in 1619 and was succeeded by Ferdinand II, a bigoted prince, who had been educated by the Jesuits. This emperor was an inveterate enemy of the Protestants. He forbade their meetings, deprived them even of civil privileges, pulled down their churches and schools, erected scaffolds in every village, appointed only Catholic magistrates, and inflicted unsparing cruelties on all who seceded from the Catholic Church. 
it was under this austrian emperor seventy-three years from the death of luther that the first act of the bloody tragedy which i am to describe was opened by an insurrection in bohemia one of the hereditary possessions of the house of austria in this kingdom isolated from the rest of germany separated on every side from adjoining states by high mountains of volcanic origin peopled with the descendants of the ancient slavonians who were characterized by impulse and impetuosity the reformed doctrines had taken a powerful hold of the affections and convictions of the people the followers of john huss and jerome of prague were something like the lollards of england in their spirit and sincerity but they were persecuted by their catholic rulers with a rigor and cruelty never seen among the lollards for ferdinand the second was the hereditary king of bohemia as well as emperor of germany at last his tyranny and cruelties became unendurable and in a violent burst of passionate indignation his deputies were thrown out of the windows of the chamber of the council of regency at prague this act of violence was the signal of a general revolt not in bohemia merely but in silesia moravia hungary and austria the celebrated count mansfeld a soldier of fortune with only four thousand troops dared to defy the whole imperial power and for a while he was successful the bohemians renounced their allegiance to ferdinand and chose for their king frederick the fifth elector palatine of the rhine son-in-law of james the first of england and head of the protestant party in germany he unwisely abandoned his electoral palace at heidelberg to grasp the royal sceptre at prague but he was no match for the austrian emperor who summoning from every quarter the allies and adherents of imperial power and making peace with other enemies poured into bohemia such overwhelming forces under maximilian duke of bavaria that his authority was established more firmly than before the battle of prague sixteen twenty decided the fate of bohemia and the elector palatine became a fugitive and his possessions were given to the duke of bavaria then followed a persecution which has had no parallel since the slaughter of the albigenses and the massacre of st bartholomew the unhappy kingdom of bohemia was abandoned to inquisitions and executions all liberties were suppressed the nobles were decimated ministers and teachers were burned or beheaded and protestants of every rank age and condition were prohibited from acting as guardians to children or making wills or contracting marriages with catholics or holding any office of trust and emolument they were outlawed as felons and disenfranchised as infidels the halls of justice were deserted the muses accompanied the learned in their melancholy flight and all that remained of bohemian gallantry and heroism forsook the land strange to say the land of huss and jerome became henceforth the strongest hold of austrian despotism and papal superstition this is one of those instances where persecution proved successful it is a hackneyed saying that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church and it is true that lofty virtues have been generally developed by self-sacrifice and martyrdom and that only through great tribulation have permanent blessings been secured the hollanders by inundating their fields and fighting literally to the last ditch preserved their liberties and secured ultimate prosperity the fires of smithfield did not destroy the reformed religion in england in the time of mary and the jails and judicial murders of later and better times did not prevent the progress of popular rights or in the extension of puritanism in the wilds of the american continent but in the history of society the instances are unfortunately numerous when bigotry and despotism have kindled their infernal fires and erected their bloody scaffolds not to purify the church and nourish the principles of christian progress but to destroy what is good as well as what is evil what availed the struggles of the waldenses in the middle ages who came to the rescue of savonarola when he attempted to reform the lives of degenerate florentines what beneficial effects resulted ultimately from the inquisition in spain how was the revocation of the edict of nantes overruled for the good of the huguenots of france and yet the unfortunate suppression of religious liberty in bohemia and the sufferings of those who came to her rescue especially the misfortunes of the elector palatine arrayed the protestant princes of germany against the emperor and created general indignation throughout europe austria became more than ever a hated and dreaded power not merely to the states of sweden denmark holland and england but to catholic france herself then ruled by that able and ambitious statesman cardinal richelieu before whose tomb in an after age the czar peter bowed in earnest homage from the recollection and admiration of his transcendent labors in behalf of absolutism even richelieu a prince of the church and the persecutor of the huguenots was alarmed at the encroachments of austria and intrigued with protestant princes to undermine her dangerous ascendancy 
then opened the second act of the bloody drama of the seventeenth century when the allied protestant princes of germany assisted by the english and the dutch rallied under the leadership of christian king of denmark and resolved to recover what they had lost when bethlen gabor a transylvanian prince at the head of an army of robbers invaded hungary and austria the emperor straitened in his finances was in no condition to meet this powerful confederacy although the illustrious tilly was the commander of his forces but the demon of despotism who never sleeps raised up to his assistance a great military genius this was wallenstein duke of friedland the richest noble in bohemia the person whom he most resembled in that age of struggle and contending forces when despotism sought unscrupulous agents was thomas wentworth earl of stratford the right hand of charles i in his warfare against the liberties of england like stratford he was an apostate from the principles in which he had been educated like him he had risen from a comparatively humble station like him his talents were as commanding as his ambition devoted first to his own exaltation and secondly to the cause of absolutism with which he sympathized with all the intensity that a proud and domineering spirit may be supposed to feel for the struggles of inexperienced democracy like the english statesman the german general was a jesuit in the use of his tools jealous of his authority liberal in his rewards and fearful in his vengeance though greedy of admiration and fond of display he surrounded himself with mystery and gloom like stratford he was commanding in his person dignified reserved and sullen with an eye piercing and melancholy a brow lowering with thought and care and a lip compressed into determination and twisted into a smile of ironical disdain this nobleman had fought with distinction as a colonel at the battle of prague when bohemian liberties had been prostrated and had signally distinguished himself in his infamous crusade against his own countrymen he offered at his own expense to raise and equip an army of fifty thousand men in the service of the emperor but demanded as a condition that he should have the appointment of all his officers and the privilege of enriching himself and army from the spoils and confiscations of conquered territories these terms were extraordinary and humiliating to an absolute sovereign yet at the crisis in which ferdinand was placed they were too tempting to be refused wallenstein fulfilled his promises and raised in an incredibly short time an immense army composed of outlaws and robbers and adventurers from all nations he advanced rapidly against the allied protestant forces levying enormous contributions wherever he appeared as imperious to friends as to foes mistrusted and feared by both yet supremely indifferent to praise or censure resting on the power of brute force and his ability to enrich his soldiers possessing a fine military genius unbounded means and unscrupulous rapacity and assisted by such generals as tilly pappenheim and piccolomini seconded by maximilian duke of bavaria he soon reduced his enemies to despair the king of denmark was unequal to the contest and sued for peace the elector frederick again became a fugitive the duke of brunswick was killed and the intrepid mansfeld died the electors of saxony and brandenburg the natural defenders of protestantism and the leading princes of the league were awed into abject neutrality the old protectors of lutheranism were timid and despairing the monarchs of europe trembled germany lay prostrate and bleeding christendom stood aghast at the greatness of the calamities which afflicted germany and threatened neighboring nations but the emperor at vienna was overjoyed and swelled with arrogance and triumph he divided among the members of his imperial house the rich benefices of the church and bestowed upon his victorious general the revenues of the provinces he now resolved to pursue the king of denmark into his remotest territories to dethrone the king of sweden to give away the crown of poland to aid the spaniards in the recovery of the united provinces to exterminate the protestant religion to subvert the liberties of the german nations and reign as a terrible incarnation of imperial tyranny he would even revive the dreams of charlemagne and charles v and make vienna the centre of that power which once emanated from born he would ally himself more strongly with the pope and extend the double tyranny of priests and kings over the whole continent of europe fines imprisonments tortures banishments and executions were now added to the desolations which one hundred fifty thousand soldiers inflicted on villages and cities that had been for generations increasing in wealth and prosperity in the dark hour of calamity and fears providence raised up a greater hero than wallenstein a noble protector and intrepid deliverer even gustavus adolphus king of sweden and the third act of the political tragedy opens with his brilliant career carlyle has somewhere said 
is not every genius an impossibility until he appear this is singularly true of gustavus adolphus it was the last thing for contemporaries to conjecture that the deliverer of germany and the great hero of the thirty years war would have arisen in the ice-bound regions of northern europe no great character had arisen in sweden of exalted fame neither king nor poet nor philosopher nor even singer the little kingdom to all appearance was rich only in mines of iron and hills of snow it was not till the middle of the sixteenth century that sweden was even delivered from base dependence on denmark but gustavus before he was thirty-five years of age had made his countrymen a nation of soldiers had freed his kingdom from danish russian and polish enemies had made great improvements in the art of war having introduced a new system of tactics never materially improved except by frederick the second had reduced strategy to a science had raised the importance of the infantry had increased the strictness of military discipline had trained up a band of able generals and inspired his soldiers with unbounded enthusiasm and he had raised in the camp a new tone of moral feeling not even cromwell equalled him in divesting war of its customary atrocities and keeping alive the spirit of religion the worship of god formed one of the most important duties of the swedish army wherever located twice every day the roll of the drum assembled the soldiers to prayer the usual vices of soldiers like profanity and drunkenness and gambling were uniformly punished death was inflicted on any soldier who assaulted a citizen in his house even a certificate was required of the chief citizens of any place where troops were quartered that their conduct had been orderly he never allowed under any provocation a city to be taken by assault a striking contrast to the imperial generals nor amid the toils and dangers of war was gustavus unmindful of his duties as a king he was one of the most enlightened statesmen that had appeared since charlemagne and alfred he established schools and colleges founded libraries reformed the codes of law introduced wise mercantile regulations rewarded eminent merit respected the voice of experience and developed the industries of the country what richelieu and colbert did for france what burley and cromwell did for england gustavus did for sweden his prime minister is illustrious for wisdom and ability the celebrated oxenstiern through whose labors and genius the country felt no impoverishment from war he laid the foundation of that prosperity 